Hello, this is UK correspondent Dottie James. Before we begin this episode of Potterless, let me clarify a mistake that Mike made last week when he and Eric thought that they didn't need to consult me about, as he put it, pass the parcel. Well, in my accent, in my particular southern accent, it is pronounced pass the parcel, which, I mean, it's very literal. You pass a parcel around a circle. So yes, Mike got it slightly, slightly wrong in the accent area. Anyway, here's Mike. Yeah, I really goofed it there. Probably should have called upon my UK correspondent to help me understand this British thing. Well, thanks to literally every single human that lives in the United Kingdom tweeting at me, I now understand that Pass the Parcel is a child's party game involving a present wrapped in a lot of different layers of wrapping, and there's all sorts of variations and stuff. I've actually heard of this game in the US, I just didn't know it had a name. My apologies for thinking that this beloved children's game is just a funny way to say hot potato. I don't really have any announcements this week, so I wanted to take this time to thank our UK correspondent, Dottie G. She is always so quick to get the British quandary audio clips to me, and she does such an amazing job, so everyone go support Dottie. Just search for her on the internet. She has great YouTube videos and poetry and TED Talks. Just search Dottie James, D-O-T-T-I-E James. She's also great on social media, so Dottie, thank you so much. And speaking of thanking people so much, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to John Atiri, Sean Fitzgerald, Sierra Acey, Tova Vickstrom, Bethany Quaid, Edward Clark, Callie Bodler, Kate Kinsman, Isabel Forslund, Kim Meacham, Natalie Nymphadora Brown, Lena Rosenquist, Cecilia, Samantha Rainier, Samantha Giles, Serena, Leah B, Rhiannon, Victoria, Amy E. Russo, Michaela Kinney, Catherine McNeil, Emily Rose, and Tyler Trigg. Shout out to my two-year-old niece, Rory Fruhoff, who upgraded her pledge. And a shout out to Lauren Cook, who upgraded to producer-level status, as well as our new producer-level patrons, Nona VM, Kyle, Zena Rosnowski, Emily Tilly, and Colleen Mage. They joined the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Kieran, Rebecca, Bede, Caitlin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Russell, Dustin, Audra, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rosanne, Andrea, Nikita, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Lovekesh, Ali, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Arna, Tiago, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Steve, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Marino, Moster, Pinky, Angelina, Rosemary, Phineas, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Arul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Heidi, Alexandra, John, Jen, Noel, Tao, Emily, Michael, Robin, Patricia, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Teal, Sina, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alicat, Hallie, Veronica, Kevin, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Lucinda, Carlos, Pam, Nikki, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Carrie, Andrea, Topher, Ella, Anthony, Weekend of Dead, Cat Ladies, David, Elisa, Lynn, Emily, Ryan, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Addie, Mark, Polly, Kimberly, Strujan, Brittany, Nita, Bavi, Tumnus, Remy, Matt, Sarah, and Can't I Potter? Who, whenever you tell them they've something in between their teeth, they know exactly which two teeth the thing is in between. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to hours of bonus content, bonus episodes, exclusive merchandise, discounts on the merch on the merch store, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 68 of Potterless, covering chapters 16 and 17, guest starring David Gordon, aka the wizard rock band, Alas Earwax. Enter thickness. Enter thickness. And enter, enter, and enter, 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 Hello, internet, and welcome to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time. My name is Mike Schubert, I am that grown man, and I am back with my good old buddy, David Gordon. David, how's it going? Oh, so good. Great, I am glad. We had you for a previous episode. We brought in Eric Silver in between because the chapters were very boring and me and him wanted to be very silly about it, but now we've got two very intense chapters, and by that I mean chapter 16, which sucked, and chapter 17, which was very a lot of things. <laughs> now, you know, you needed the brief before we got to uh, the intensity that is chapter 17. Yeah, it's like the palate cleanser of... <laughs> the sorbet. <laughs> it's the calm before the storm. She's like, maybe before this crazy intense chapter, let's have one that is so boring that they're caught off guard. <laughs> and then they'll get hit in the face with whatever the heck the chapter 17 is, and then boom. It's like the Christmas Eve that comes before the Christmas morning that is... Um Chapter 18. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get right into it mainly so we can get over with chapter 16 and into chapter 17. So chapter 16 is called Godric's Hollow. Harry wakes up hoping that the Ron fight was just a dream, but obviously it was not. 
Hermione not doing so hot, and Harry realizes that with the charms that they've put on around their tent and everything, Ron can't find them if he had a sudden change of heart and wanted to come back. Yeah, like immediately. He could have walked right out of camp, changed his mind, and nope. Yeah, he could have been like, actually, or like he forgot something like, oh man, I left my, (laughs) nope, you're screwed. So they end up packing and then they disapparate to the hillside. They don't talk about Ron the entire time, but Harry does check the Marauders map to see if he would show up at the school, thinking that he would be totally fine with the blood purity status of the Weasleys. Which again is just the weirdest thing. I don't know that he's right about that. I think even Ron would end up like having to face some questioning at this point. Mm -hmm. But that is just kind of weird to imagine that it is... Entirely probable that literally Harry Potter's best friend has at least a 50-50 chance of just walking back into school and being like, what's up? Yeah, I was sick. What's up? (laughs) Oh, what a stupid system. (laughs) So, but what Harry ends up doing is seeing Ginny's name and then staring at it with an intensity so great that he hopes it lets her know that he's thinking of her, which, good luck with that, bud. Hey, uh, so... I know we haven't been in contact, but I want you to know I've been uh, watching your little GPS pin move around the map, and <laughs> I've been thinking of you. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know what he, like, it's not like he has the same connection with Ginny that he and Voldemort has. There's nothing, there's nothing going on I there. Mean, maybe like via Voldemort, right? <laughs> like, Voldemort's been in her head, Voldemort's been in his head. <laughs> They've kissed, so it transferred, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just this beautiful triangle of... Love and evil. <laughs> so Phineas Nigelis, though, cannot resist trying to learn more about what Harry is doing. So every few days, he comes through his painting blindfolded to talk to them about what's happening at Hogwarts and try to get information out of the squad. And he is obsessed with Snape, though. He doesn't ever speak ill of him. He's very happy. And the justification of this is that, aside from Phineas, Snape is the only other headmaster to have come from Slytherin. Well, he's the only headmaster from Slytherin since Phineas. Oh, okay. There were people before, maybe. I mean, probably. I mean, maybe. There there are a lot of portraits on that wall. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. But there's also a lot of bad people in Slytherin. (laughs) Well, there's also probably, let's face it, a lot of bad people on that wall. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I mean, Phineas isn't the best Like Those uh, those people lived before in in the past times. Mm. And as we all know, the past is a terrible place full of terrible people. Very bad. Very bad. So unlike the present. (laughs) So Phineas informs Harry and Hermione that they're there is a mutiny of students against Snape led by none other than Ginny Weasley. It causes Snape to reinstate Umbridge's decree of no gatherings of three or more and no unofficial clubs, a.k.a. Dumbledore's army. Take that, polyamorous couples. <laughs> Hermione has been reading Tales of Beetle the Bard a lot and asks Harry about a symbol drawn at the top of one of the pages. And when Harry looks at it, he realizes it's the same symbol that Crumb got mad at Luna's dad for wearing at the wedding. So it's that triangle, circle, whatever. They keep calling it a triangular eye, but I've seen this symbol before. I still don't know what it means. I would not call that an eye. It looks like a triangle with a circle in the middle of it. My first thought is not like, ah, yes, and a triangular eye. I mean, I... (laughs) I guess if you were trying to express it in as few words as possible and you can only use words and you can't use pictures, it's not a bad way to do it. Yes. As as opposed to just every time it comes up, it's that triangle with a line down the center and then a circle that is tangent to each of its three sides. What I don't understand is they haven't shown this drawing in the book yet. And there's been other times in the books where they put some sort of picture or image. Obviously, they have all the illustrations. And for example, in the sixth book, you had the note that Hagrid wrote to Harry about Aragog dying that had tears all over it and stuff. So clearly, they have the ability to put more than just text in. I don't understand why they didn't make this somewhere in the book. I don't know if it comes in later or something, but they just haven't shown it, which I find to be a weird choice since it's become, and I'm assuming it will continue to be, an important symbol that means something. I don't get why you haven't shown it. Hmm. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know that they've ever shown anything that wasn't text, though. Like, even, like, the tear stains are, like, an effect, but it's still just text. I don't think they've ever shown a drawing. Yeah, you're right. There's never been a drawing I guess the close thing is they have signatures of people and that, but even that isn't. No, that, that I, I will say that that is interesting because it, 
maybe I will look back and find this wrong, but I, I guess now that I think about it, it hasn't appeared even in like the chapter heading pictures. No, it's not the illustrations. Where it could have. So yeah, that is that is an interesting choice to keep it completely verbal and not actually draw the picture. But I guess if this was any other book where the chapters didn't start with a picture, it would yeah. be that weird <laughs> that we didn't get a picture of something. Yeah, I guess in JK's defense, you're right. It would be way more annoying to not, like triangular eye at least is two words. Calling it a triangle with a circle in the middle and a line down the center is like, oh, Jesus. Well, like, like, have you ever read descriptions of coats of arms? Oh, man, it doesn't it sound just, fun. So like there, there is an official way to describe all of the potential things that could appear in like the shield design of a coat of arms. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You, you know, you you describe the color of the background, the shape and color of the foreground, uh -huh. and then any additional things. So, like, there's some things, you know, if it's a red background with a gold diagonal stripe across it, that's fine. That takes a couple of words. Sure. But then you get these absurd coats of arms that are like, okay, so <laughs> it's a shield. It's divided into four parts. The parts are red, gold, blue, and black. In the upper left-hand part, there are three lions. <laughs> in the lower right hand part, there are two lions. In the right, and just like describing each bit, and by the end of it, you're just like, this, just show me a picture. Yeah. Please just show me a picture. This is always funny for me because I grew up in New Jersey, and the state flag of New Jersey is very old school y and like that, where I think it's a like a lady holding scales and stuff. Yeah, so the New Jersey state flag is like two ladies, one holding a cornucopia, one holding a stick that has like a beanie on the end of it. And then there's a horse in the middle with a bunch of like flowers on it. The horse head is on top of a helmet from like those old school like knight in armor things. And then there's a shield in the middle of it that is like three, I don't even know what they are. Like three things that look like you used to get crops. And then it says Liberty and Prosperity 1776. This is a very intense thing. And I remember in fourth grade, we had to draw this once. And uh, <laughs> that was not a fun day for anyone. And then I just didn't know what any other state flags looked like until probably sixth grade when you get a textbook that is all of them. And then I looked at other states. So I was like, what? What? Like Colorado? Like, whoa, come on. That's just a cool looking design. And like South Carolina, like it's a tree. <laughs> I was jealous of not mainly because I hated this homework assignment where I had to draw this thing. I was like, man, I wanted to have the one that's just like a circle with lines. Well, so you can see uh, we're both looking at the, uh, the Wikipedia page for flag and coat of arms of New Jersey. Uh, it actually has like what I was talking about, the heraldic description uh, oh, yeah? of what the image is. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, so just the shield is azure, pur pale, three plows proper, which tells you the color of the background, mm -hmm. the direction that they're facing, like what they are. That it's not blue, it's azure. Yeah, no, sorry, I mean, it, it's, it's all very French, <laughs> uh, all of this heraldry and such. But there's so much more details once you get into the helmet that's on top of it and the supporters on the side of it and the scroll underneath it with the motto and the amazingly detailed and very long New Jersey statute title 52, section 2-1. So, you know, for further reading, uh -huh. Wikipedia, flag and coat of arms of New Jersey, you'll regret it. My homeland. I'm so proud of them. So good. So very, very good. So anyway, yeah, triangular, I, I retract my statement of saying it's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> In conclusion... <laughs> so Harry tells Hermione the whole story that it's Grindelwald's mark. He explains the whole interaction between Crumb and Luna's dad and Harry at the wedding. And Hermione is shocked. He then tells Hermione that he wants to go to Godric's Hollow. And she agrees, much to Harry's surprise. He's confused as to why. And Hermione says, because the sword might be there. She brings up that Godric's Hollow is where Godric Gryffindor is from. And Harry had no idea. She responds with, Harry, did you ever even open a history of magic? And he says, Erm, I might have opened it, you know, when I bought it just the once. Here's my question. <laughs> <laughs> is Godric Gryffindor named after his hometown? Other way around. The town is named after him. Yes. Okay. He was that cool. Okay, good. That makes me feel better because I was going to be terrified that this is like naming a girl from Brooklyn, Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> like I was I was very afraid that that's what it was going to be. OK, so he's OK. This makes me. OK. Whew. Yeah. No, I'm he, very relieved. So remember, he's a big, like he's big, important, old. long time ago wizard. Sure. And there aren't that many wizards. So if we're going to name a town mm -hmm. after one of them, it's probably one of the four we've heard. of. It seems strange to name it after someone's first name. How often do you do that? It seems like if you're going to name a town after someone.
Washington or a state Washington. Like it's not, it's not like it's George DC. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a town of George Washington. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, yep. That's, I mean, I guess to be fair, that's still paired with the state. Yeah. Not they didn't name the state George. The first name. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any other place that's named after the first name of somebody well, famous any, or important. Named after Queen Victoria. Although, again, oh, kings and queens go by names, their first yeah. names. Uh, no, you're right. That's pretty weird. <laughs> Although, on the other hand, if, if I had to choose between living in Godric's Hollow and Gryffindor's Hollow, I think I'd pick Godric, too. Yeah, Gryffindor's would be annoying, especially if you're a Ravenclaw living in Gryffindor's Hollow. That wouldn't be fun. <laughs> Yeah, because I would, uh, it'd be like if I lived in a town called Baseball Town. Sure, if I lived in a town called Boston Red Soxville, I would hate it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Godric's Hollow is also where the first golden snitch was forged. So, boo, don't go. Don't go there. It doesn't sound like a good place. I can't wait till we get to Potterless Reads Quidditch Through the Ages. <laughs> oh, boy. I did half of it for a live show that I did when I opened up for Join the Party. And I just got through halfway through the book. It was stressful. It was bad. Fun fact, did you know that there are 700 fouls in Quidditch? Did you know that 600 of them deal with using a wand? Hey, here's a thought. Make rule number one, no wands. Oh, wow. Look at all this money we've saved on ink. I mean, I always got the impression that the rules of Quidditch were just kind of like... <laughs> Go figure it out. <laughs> oh, no, shoot. What's the name of... Calvin Ball? No, what is the... Uh, okay, so it, it reminded me of things Skippy is no longer allowed to do. What is this? Was, so it was, like, it was passed around, you know, like, who? I don't remember if it was a, a real thing or not, but just somebody had this list of things that are apparently not allowed in the army. Okay. And it just based on the order of the list, like, you could kind of <laughs> tell that, like, after having been told he wasn't allowed to do the first thing, mm -hmm. he tried to do something else. <laughs> and then was told that was also not okay. And mm -hmm. then after a couple, there would be, like, a broader pronunciation announcement about any general thing mm. in that but none of class. the rules are that dogs can't play basketball yes that's there, always fine there ain't no rule that says a dog can't play basketball <laughs> i'm so glad you said the exact <laughs> quote uh so like that was always kind of the impression that i got of the rules of quidditch was that like they'd never like codified like a set of rules it was just every time something new came up mm -hmm. they were just like that's illegal <laughs> that makes sense harry didn't even make the connection about gryffindor and godric's hollow which seems super dumb now knowing that the town is named after him <laughs> he just wanted to go see his parents graves and the house where the attack happened and maybe talk to bathilda bagshot as well and i uh, just I'm very disappointed that Harry didn't even think like, oh yeah, right, Godric Gryffindor, sure, the sword, that might make sense. Also, Dumbledore is from there. Maybe that makes sense. Just all of his thoughts were just selfish, like, oh, here are things I want to do that are all about me. Ugh. I mean, on the other hand, I absolutely sympathize. Sure. Especially, you know, not being a literary character, mm -hmm. connections between like Godric and Godric Gryffindor. Eh, it could be a coincidence. <laughs> uh, not not in a book. <laughs> Harry doesn't know he's in a book, so I will I will give him a pass on that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't even get it until they said it. So I don't know. I feel like there there is also something that's very interesting about like at this point, like after everything that's happened, like this is the time that Harry thinks to himself, like. I want to go back to where my parents live because, mm -hmm. you know, like he, that either hasn't been an option or just like didn't really occur to him yeah. before. But I, I think to my experience, at least that feels pretty true to like, yeah, like that's important. And like, sure. Like now that he thinks of it, like, yeah, it has mm -hmm. a really strong draw, but like, I don't know, like you, you don't think about stuff like that usually until it's like too late. Sure. Like, oh man, like I wish I could have asked, you know, my grandparents about mm -hmm. whatever, everything, right? Like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, there's something that's a little bit, like, poignant to me about, like, oh, yeah, obviously, like, very late mm -hmm. to this interest party, <laughs> but I, I don't know, I feel that. Yeah, and, and we'll get into it later, but I find it very strange that he's never thought to go there because this place is kind of like a museum. They have, like, the sign and all the other stuff. It seems very strange to me that no one's ever talked to Harry about it, but I'll get into that when we actually get what, to that part. What kid wants to go to a museum? <laughs> <laughs> so... Hermione wonders if Bathilda has the sword. Harry doesn't buy it, but he decides to go along with the plan anyway and tell Hermione that it's a good idea just so that they can do the things that he wants to do. It's interesting that Hermione finds that a reasonable conclusion, but has absolutely rejected out of hand several 
like decently reasonable ideas of Harry's. Sure. At this point, <laughs> yeah. and will continue to do so over mm-hmm. the rest of the book. <laughs> we're like, this seems further out than several of the things yeah. that Hermione dismisses, which I mean, I, I think also speaks to the ridiculousness of the riddle they're trying to solve. And this also is the top place where Voldemort might be. Oh, and yeah. the fact that they didn't have a more lengthy discussion of like, what if this is going to lead to our death? That surprised me. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> it's a dangerous move, but it's what's happening. Yep, and it doesn't pan out, as we'll see. So I was confused here because I thought Bathilda just said mean stuff about Dumbledore in Rita's book, but I actually talked to Kelly about this earlier today, and she said, yeah, but it's Rita Skeeter, so they might just be thinking that she's not actually a mean person or hates Dumbledore. It might just be Rita twisting everything like she does. Well, and I think they have on other people's authority like uh, Harry's mom's letter that they mm-hmm. found at Royal right. Place that Bethilda does know what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. So at least the connection's not made up. <laughs> <laughs> so Hermione starts devising a plan. Harry then zones out because he's Harry and he wants to leave the next day. Hermione, though, being a rational human being, takes precautions because Voldemort is probably planning for them to go back here. She ensures that they get good polyjuice disguises for muggles. And with all of this, just adding on to all the other stuff Hermione has done throughout this entire camping escapade, Harry would be so screwed. Oh, he'd be dead. He'd be beyond dead without her. He, uh, uh, just, she's really pulling all of the weight here. <laughs> so they get some, some hair from some random muggles that were going Christmas shopping. They make the potion, they drink up, they don the invisibility cloak, and then they apparate into Godric's Hollow. There is snow everywhere, which they didn't account for, and they need to think about the prince. So Hermione says that she can cover the tracks, and Harry then convinces her, hey, we've already got the disguises on. Let's just ditch the invisibility cloak. So they approach the graveyard, and they hear caroling and people what apparently seem to be at like a Christmas Eve mass of sorts. And that's when Hermione realizes, oh, wow, it's Christmas Eve. We've really lost track of time. Which I do find fascinating, given how precise Hermione is about everything else. Mm Mm-hmm. That she doesn't have a very up to date calendar. Yeah, which I mean, to some extent makes sense because it's not super important to them at this point in the planning process. Mm-hmm. You know, she probably did not think to pack a calendar given sure. that they didn't leave home knowing they weren't coming back. Mm-hmm. But just, yeah, the fact that even she hasn't really been keeping track of time. <laughs> So they pass a war memorial in the town square, which is shaped like an obelisk. But then as they pass it, it transforms into a statue of James and Lily with Harry, like defending Harry. So it's clearly some sort of monument towards the Potters. And I'm guessing this is just some sort of magic wear to muggles or from wizards far away. It looks like (laughs) one thing. And then when you get close enough, like it's one of those things from the 90s where you would put it in opposite directions and see two different pictures or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's got to be invisible to muggles. Mm -hmm. But I assume the benefit to making it only visible to wizards when you're close is that that way, as you walk up, you know what everyone else is seeing, so uh-huh. you don't look super oh, weird yeah, yeah. when you're just, like, staring at something that no one else can see. <laughs> this statue is pretty cool just as itself changing and stuff, and it's pretty sweet that they have it in the town as well. And pretty cool that it's well-protected enough that Voldemort hasn't just come in and smashed Right? It. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the cemetery, Hermione finds the graves of Kendra and Ariana Dumbledore, and there's a quote under them that says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Harry tries to figure out why Dumbledore, first off, never went here with him, since in this graveyard is Dumbledore's family and Harry's family, which I think is very valid. It seems like something that they could have and maybe should have done earlier. I don't know, that'd be kind of a weird bonding experience. Like, oh man, look at our dead families. (laughs) (laughs) True. (laughs) I want to backtrack for just a second. Sure. Because I remember even as a kid getting to this point and thinking, wait a second, that's a passage from the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're buried in a church graveyard. Mm -hmm. I have questions about wizard theology. I've had questions ever since they get off for Easter. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, like, and yeah, so have I. Like, I think even in the first book, somebody says, oh, my God. Uh, And Ron says it in, I think, the sixth book, because I remember it stood out to me. It's either in the sixth or the seventh book he said it, and I was like, whoa, that's weird. I don't remember reading this ever before. Yeah, which, I mean, again, it's not... 
it's not unusual. They're no. like modern, well, quote unquote modern. They're 90s sure. teenagers. It just doesn't happen in the books a lot. It might only happen twice. Yeah. And, it, you know, I think Rowling made the correct choice to never address what wizards think about religion mm -hmm. because she already gets enough crap from people who think that yeah. she's promoting Satanism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the overall tone of the books is certainly not out of line with Christian theology mm -hmm. in terms of like you have kind of sort of a messiah story sure like you have themes of like death and uh you know in the first book we get someone who chooses not to live forever mm -hmm. so we have we have all of these themes but like they never explicitly address it and I'm just really curious like are there wizard catholics yeah like I feel like Probably not, because on the one hand, the Catholic Church acknowledges that witchcraft is a thing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's a thing that you're absolutely not supposed to be involved with. Uh, yeah. So I feel like you would have to be some kind of wizard Protestant. Mm -hmm. I like. I don't feel like they would be Church of England, probably, because they'd like they'd already gone into hiding at the time they split. And why are you going to join this Muggle Church, whatever? Anyway, I have a lot of questions. Yeah. I, I also find it interesting that presumably, since the only people they knew probably were wizards mm -hmm. that whoever presumably one of the still living Dumbledores got to decide what quote got on this grave yeah so Harry says it's got to be Dumbledore because he was the only living one left or at least was the oldest living one at yeah. the time of their deaths and so I looked it up just to mm -hmm. to be checking myself but it's uh Matthew uh chapter 6 verse 21 uh and it's also Luke chapter 12 verse 34 mm -hmm. and i don't know i mean i feel like as we find more in the the background of these people and more, like more about dumbledore as we go on you can kind of see how it might apply to the original context but the original context is very much like you know think of spiritual things have your treasures be in heaven because you know if that's where you find your value that's where your focus will be that's the like will define the kind of life that you live mm -hmm. but you know, based on the fact that we don't get any insight into wizard theology, yeah. it would seem like the meaning is somehow like we're taking that meaningful verse, but we're finding a different meaning. From I think that's what context, it is. And you know? what and and if anything, what it might be, because I agree, I don't think that any wizards are going to be practicing Catholics, but it is an interesting discussion. I think it could be something where Dumbledore just reads the quote is like, that's a nice quote, like someone taking a quote out of some other religious text that they don't necessarily subscribe to, but it could still be a quote that is a good message that they support. I think it's got to be something like this. But I do want to know if Jesus was a wizard in the Harry Potter world or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, that guy. Oh, yeah. Turn water to wine. Come on. <laughs> I have seen some interesting discussions going on in various corners of the Internet yeah. that tackle that and I think are, are really fascinating. But I remember as a kid reading through this and being like that is interesting wait a second <laughs> uh, and so that has lingered in my brain and i'm going to talk about it again in a second when we get to the next one yeah so harry then thinks the quote is important and tries to figure out the meaning behind it because dumbledore is the one who would have picked it out being the oldest family member left hermione then finds an extremely old grave with the grindelwald mark on it they clear off the grave and they think it says ignotus which i I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't it's all French to me. I don't know what that is, so I'm sure it'll be very important in six chapters. Hermione then finds the graves of Harry's parents. His parents were 21 and they died on Halloween. Here's something that did we know that it was on Halloween or did I miss it? I don't know that that has come up. Okay. But that would make the first chapter of the first book be taking place on All Saints Day, which is an interesting. Yeah. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, I just, I th I was a little disappointed of it being Halloween. Like, really? Halloween? Really? Oh, e oh, when did the death happen? On the creepy, spooky holiday. Woo, I don't know. I just thought it was dumb, but it's whatever. But it does allow for a funny moment where, uh, where Voldemort later in chapter 17 wants to murder a trick-or-treater for no reason. <laughs> so the quote that is on the graves of the Potters says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 
And Harry asks if this is some sort of Death Eater thing. And Hermione says, no, it's about living after death. And then narrator Harry says, but they were not living, thought Harry. They were gone. Well, no shit, Harry. This is like a metaphor. It's not literal, like, living. Oh, God. Oh, come on. Get it together, Harry. I mean, I I agree with Harry on some level. I think. Well, okay. So two things. First Corinthians 15. Uh, verse 26. Okay. That's the whole verse. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In the context of that verse, they're talking about the Christian resurrection. Okay. Right? That Christ died for our sins, rose again on the third day. Literally and, came back to yeah, life. Yeah, literally came back to life. And because of that, we as Christians will also literally come back to life. But in heaven, not physically. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, there's obviously like a lot of different in that interpretation. Sure. But in the scripture... That is literally what they are describing. Yeah. Death is destroyed by the sacrifice of Christ. Hermione's like pseudo like, <laughs> uh, I'm trying hold on. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah, tra- she- I'm, tra- I'm going to pull out her actual. No. Yeah. Go for it. But that also brings up another question. Is there a wizard heaven or a wizard afterlife, or is it just people that are paintings? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So Hermione's actual explanation It doesn't mean defeating death in the way the Death Eaters mean it, Harry. It means, you know, living beyond death, living after death. And take away the theological, like, aspect of this, because I don't think Hermione's trying to make a theological statement there. That's a bad explanation for someone who's staring at his dead parents' grave. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like, I think Harry has a very valid point that, like, the wizard afterlife is unknown right like they Mm -hmm. they've addressed that before at the end of book five when harry talks to nick Mm -hmm. and nick says like yeah like i stayed here as a ghost so i don't actually know what happens when you die like we we just don't know and so i feel like in the overall theme of the story i definitely understand what that means Right, like when Dumbledore says in Chamber of Secrets, like, I'll never be gone from Hogwarts as long as anyone here remembers me. Mm -hmm. Right, I think that's, that's closer. Yeah. You know, we, we live on in our friends, we live on through the positive impact that we had on the world. And for a good person, that's enough Mm -hmm. to be satisfied with life and to be accepting of death, like, you know, Nicholas Flamel is like, all of that stuff. And in that way, I think it is an interesting and profound philosophical statement. What Hermione says is not. (laughs) Yeah, Hermione didn't do the best job of it because the biggest problem with her explanation is that she could have pointed to concrete examples of literally Harry's parents living on after death because you have the thing in the fourth book with the Priorian Cantatum where they come back and give him advice. And then also Harry's mom and her sacrifice very much live on after her death because it's what keeps Harry alive and what defeated Voldemort the first time and kept him away for so many years, etc. She has very much lived on after death not only in the memory sense and not only in the inspirational sense but also through harry by keeping him alive and safe and protected so you're you're right is that harry is justified to feel this way in that hermione doesn't do a good job of explaining it (laughs) she probably should have been like look at these examples that have happened to you (laughs) i mean she you know she didn't prep a sermon and that's fine (laughs) Uh, she wasn't ready to give a homily (laughs) I do think it's interesting, and I I wonder on this one, too, who chose that? Who chose the verse on the grave for this one? Maybe Dumbledore again. He found a Bible and was like, oh, look at this interesting muggle book. Look at all these fun quotes. My guesses would be, I guess, Dumbledore or Lupin? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, it could be Lupin. But I I don't know. I think it's interesting because this one, much more clearly than the last one, has, I think, been chosen for a reason that has nothing to do with its meaning mm-hmm. in its original context. No, yeah. Which is, is also certainly not unexpected even for somebody who was a devout Christian to mm-hmm. just take a verse that out of context means what they mean and mm-hmm. kind of ignore the context that it came from. People do it all the time. Yeah, like for, you know, for as good reasons as bad reasons, uh, whatever. But I I don't know. I remember as the like 16 or 17 year old me who originally read this mm-hmm. with my Bible being like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and still waiting for that dissertation on wizard theology. Yeah, maybe one day. So Harry is overcome with emotion. Hermione grabs his hand again. 
Hermione makes a Christmas wreath appear. Harry puts it on the grave. They embrace, and then they leave. And that is the end of chapter 16. But before we get into chapter 17, I know I'm going to have to have an ad read here. So it's time for Wingardium Adridosa. Ooh. <laughs> Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by HelloFresh. Look, as we've discussed in these camping chapters, the squad wants nothing more than the ability to make food appear out of midair. But wouldn't it be great if your mailman was a wizard and just made food appear at your doorstep? Well, with HelloFresh, that's possible. HelloFresh takes care of all the planning, shopping, and recipe building through what some would say is a meal kit delivery service, but what I would say is magic. HelloFresh takes care of the shopping, planning, and recipe making, so all you need to do is get the food and cook it and be a healthier you. They send you fresh pre-portioned ingredients, and all of the recipes are only six steps and have pictures. They make it so simple. An amazing thing about HelloFresh is that it is such an easy way to expand your cooking skills and to step out of your comfort zone by trying a new recipe. I recently made the crispy cheddar frico burger from my HelloFresh box, and I don't have a grill anymore now that I've moved to New York. I thought burgers were just a lost art for me. With HelloFresh, it's possible. And you all can get $80 off your first month of HelloFresh if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80 and enter code Potterless80. Again, 80 freaking dollars off your first month of HelloFresh if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80 and enter code Potterless80. So go sign up and prove Hermione wrong that you can use magic to make food today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Calm. Look, it goes without saying that the squad was incredibly stressed on this camping trip. And if they were a little less on edge, I don't think that Ron would have ditched them. Everything would have all been better. All their problems could have been resolved if they just had the app Calm. That's because Calm is the number one app to help you reduce anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. The way they do that is through guided meditations that focus on issues like anxiety, stress, and focus. And they have a brand new meditation each and every Every day. They also have sleep stories, which are nice little bedtime stories for adults that are very soothing. They'll have falling rain in the background. Very relaxing. Some of them are even narrated by Stephen Fry, who did the audiobooks for Harry Potter. And you lovely human beings can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription if you go to calm.com slash Potterless. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash Potterless to get 25% off a Calm premium subscription and get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today. You can get everything right as you sign up. Again, that's calm.com slash Potterless. And be more relaxed and don't ditch your friends while they search for a Horcrux today. All right, wow. Don't you want to buy whatever those things were? Great. So <laughs> oh, let's get into chapter... I'll buy 12. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. This is like way too far in the future, but with like a pass one, be like, yes, I would like 12 boxes from Stitch Fix, please. <laughs> Send me 60 articles of clothing. <laughs> so chapter 17. I'll take 12 subscriptions to Skill Share. I'll take 12 audio books. I mean, that's more but believable. All of them need to be free. <laughs> I want 12 30-day free trials. <laughs> so I want a year. Or just 360 days. You'd be five days shy. <laughs> <laughs> no! My last five days. Okay, please cut this part out. Hey, hey, David, it's me editing, Mike. I hate to break it to you, but I can't edit that part out. It was too freaking funny. I'm leaving it in. So they put on the cloak. Hermione tries to plan how they're going to find Bathilda, but Harry is fixated on something at the end of the road. And what it turns out to be is the ruined house of Harry's parents. The Fidelius charm clearly died with James. And Hermione thinks that the reason that nobody rebuilt it could be because kind of like with George losing an ear from dark magic and it being unable to be healed, it could be the same thing with this destruction done to the house. It's like Wizard Chernobyl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry touches the gate to walk in and a sign rises up out of the ground, which I think is very interesting and highly unnecessary, <laughs> seeing that we've just had a statue that is hidden to muggles. You could just have a sign, but no, dramatic effect because we're wizards. So it rises up out of the ground and tells the tale of what happened there. The sign says that the house is invisible to muggles and that it was left as a monument to the potters. And this is the part where I get very confused of how no one has told Harry that this exists yet. I don't know if it's necessarily a tourist destination, but it seems like to be an important monument 
in wizarding history. It's the equivalent of some sort of American memorial that a lot of people would see. And I think it's very strange that no one has been like, oh yeah, I've been to your parents' thing in Gajakalo. It's awesome, you know? I don't know that I would want to go to that. I don't know that I would want to go to it. Do you know what I mean? Like, especially at the beginning of the books where he's very kind of resentful of being famous yeah. you know, for a thing that he didn't was, really yeah, that he do didn't know about and mm-hmm. that he didn't do. And that on some level I can also see like, how does that come up in conversation? Like, Hey, so you know the house where your parents got murdered? Yeah. But I mean, people still at least talk about the grassy knoll. There's no good that came from that. There's good that came from this. It just, I don't know. It seems like, it seems like there would have been one person in his entire life that would have been to this thing. Oh man, because Harry Potter, I've been to your house. Well, I, I, I feel like, I mean, especially because we'll see in a bit that like there's this uplifting graffiti that's written on the sign that says things like, good luck, Harry, we're behind you, wherever you are, long live Harry Potter, etc. It seems like there is a positive connotation with the house because people don't necessarily view it as the place where two people died. It's more of the place where Lily's love kept Harry safe and defeated Voldemort. I'm just surprised that if there's all of this museum type aspect to it, like a historical monument type thing, and they've got the statue near it, it seems weird that no one, even Dumbledore, like nobody's told Harry that this exists. That seems weird to me. I don't know. I feel like some of it is Harry's curiosity about his parents has always been very tied to their like memories much more than the place right like he when he finds people who knew them like he asked them about them or like it's pictures of them or whatever but like he hasn't been curious about godric's hollow until now now. that's true which again i feel like is kind of on point that like losing dumbledore has kind of like brought him around to this place of like being more curious in that way yeah because it's that regret like you're saying with the grandparents it's like oh man dumbledore and i from the same town and we never talked about it (laughs) where you know if dumbledore was still alive like he still probably wouldn't be thinking (laughs) not at all zero percent right like he still wouldn't be like asking these questions or like how come like we never talked about this was like how come you never talked about this right like yeah, how come you didn't bring this up? Mm-hmm. Like, how come this is the first time you've thought to no. be mad that this is a topic of conversation <laughs> that didn't come up? Uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I could definitely see it having come up, but I almost feel like that would have been like you. You know, look at like Colin Creevy or somebody. Coming he should out. have said something. He would right. have. Oh, I took a selfie with my camera at your your parents death house right but i think the thing is right if he had said that i feel like he would be so much less a sympathetic character because that's such a terrible thing to oh, say to awful. trash trash garbage garbage <laughs> uh, uh so yeah I, I'll, I'll agree it's a little strange that he didn't know but given harry's lack of curiosity about sure. everything else. yeah mm-hmm. yep, 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 yep. so when they see the graffiti on the sign hermione has a very hermione moment where she says they shouldn't have written on the sign which harks back to her book one days when I didn't like her because she was just a big old narc. But Harry is glad that people wrote on the sign. He thinks it's brilliant. So a woman then approaches right off the bat. I knew this has to be Bathilda, right? Turns out it is. She stares at them even though they are cloaked. And it gives Harry the impression that she knows not only where they are, but who they are. She then beckons them to come with her. And Harry asks if she's Bathilda. But what I thought would have been really funny is if she was just like a weird old lady and it's a ghost. Are you Bethilda? She's like, oh, what? Oh, who's there? Like (laughs) She was just being a creepy lady, like happened to be staring exactly where they are and make a motion that looks like beckoning. But she can't see them at all. Uh, Would have been so good if she just freaked out. Just are you Bethilda? No. Yeah, no, I, who's that? What uh, are the chances? <laughs> but Bathilda nods, and she leads them to her house. Harry feels the locket beating harder and harder, which at first he thinks is a good thing, but turns out not a good thing at all. <laughs> While they are helping her clean up the sitting room that she called Harry into, Harry comes across a photo of that same wizard, Grindelwald, that he keeps seeing from the book that Dumbledore was in and then the flashback that Harry saw from Voldemort's Legilimens seeing out of Grigorovich, which is a very like this. Da, 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 da. I remember you remembering me remembering you. <laughs> where I, where you were inside my brain and then we were inside his brain seeing a flashback. Ugh, very complicated. 
Harry finally makes the connection now because Harry didn't realize that this is the same person he saw in the picture in the Dumbledore book. So now he has gotten it, even though I was way ahead of this because I am so smart. <laughs> Look at me. I have graduated college. <laughs> <laughs> So Harry asks her who it is. She gives no response. He keeps getting increasingly upset, just asking louder and louder. Hermione calmly asks why she brought them there. She gives no response, but she motions for them to go upstairs with her. But then it becomes clear when they actually try to go upstairs that she only wants Harry to go upstairs. And this is the first rule of when you have a creepy situation. Like, you don't split up. <laughs> you don't let this happen. This is like if you're selling to someone on Craigslist or something. You have your friend to make sure it's not sketchy. And you don't separate. Look, I, uh, I saw your ad for the Sword of Gryffindor on Craigslist. <laughs> Wondering if uh, you could come pick it up in my creepy house. Come upstairs with me. Your friend stays down here. <laughs> yes. Harry's justification for them splitting up, though, is that maybe Dumbledore entrusted the sword to Bethilda and told her to only give it to Harry. So I think that's a bit of a problem, though, because clearly Dumbledore has planned for the situation and was okay with Harry telling Ron and Hermione about all of the stuff in the Horcruxes. So it feels like if this was a leave it for Harry thing, he probably would have been okay with it, but we have no idea. I mean, no, we don't. We don't, uh, but we do. But, well, no, we, we do in a way because we know when he swapped out the sword, right? He swapped out the sword right before he died. Right or he would have had to have swapped the sword before. Yeah, because Phineas talked about it, but did he say when? No, because the only thing Phineas said was that the last time he saw the sword taken was out of its when case it was swapped. Was when Dumbledore destroyed the ring. Oh, but that happened in book six. Yeah, and that so that okay. that happened like earlyish in book yeah. six, and Phineas has not seen the sword out of its case yeah. between then and it getting stolen. So in theory, if when they did the switch, Dumbledore then went back and gave it to Bethilda. Mm -hmm. You would think that by this time, Dumbledore is already okay with Harry, Hermione, and Ron all knowing the whole plan. Right. So it seems a bit weird that they didn't at least even bring up the thought of like, oh, well, well, if Dumbledore, you know, I don't know. I just, it's, of course, it's the ultimate hindsight 2020 knowing what's left, but well, I don't know. I just don't like that they separated. I just don't like it. I mean, I, I can see the argument for especially <laughs> seeing how like daughtery Bethilda is. Mm -hmm. just being like okay just go along with what the old lady says true let's just, just whatever it takes to keep her happy let's mm -hmm. just get the thing yeah because they're getting frustrated with her not giving answers and walking really slowly and being i i get i get that from from that perspective and the one thing that you gotta hand it to voldemort slash nagini slash everybody this is brilliant oh yeah this is great. brilliant planning and also you can kind of see the way that quote unquote uh Bethilda <laughs> is double checking. Uh huh. Right. She's spotted them. She's like got them inside, but they're still polyjuiced. Right. Mm -hmm. So she's making sure, making sure, making sure before anything happens, mm -hmm. which is, you know, an admirable level of uh, restraint yeah. and uh, thoroughness that mm -hmm. I very much appreciate. <laughs> well-crafted villainry so <laughs> so they split up while they're walking up the stairs the horcrux starts beating harder and harder and harry's thought is that oh is it because the horcrux is getting scared and knows that the thing that can kill it is up here spoiler alert big old no <laughs> on that one harry uh so they go upstairs and then she speaks to him asks if he is harry he confirms and he asks if she has anything for him multiple times. And then uh, things get a little weird. The Horcrux <laughs> starts freaking out. His scar starts to tickle. And the room momentarily dissolves. And then there's a Voldemort voice that's like, hold him. And Harry asks again if she has anything for him. She says that she does. And then shit gets crazy. So she turns into a snake, but not just any snake, Nagini. And not just turning into a snake, but the snake erupts out of her neck so <laughs> just absolute bonkersness here and david before i read these chapters you told me to record myself reading this chapter just for this part just for this part i will say that the audio file was a whole lot of nothing and then my reaction to this which i'm going to play for you now so you can have your <laughs> genuine reaction so here is the exact audio reaction that i had when the snake came out of her neck and i will play it <laughs> for all of us to hear oh oh a snake pouring a snake pouring out of her neck 
Is Nagini coming out of her neck? <laughs> that was uh, my gender reaction. Thank you for making me record me reading this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and for our Patreon listeners, you can hear the full audio file <laughs> of 30 minutes of silence <laughs> preceding that outburst. I mean, yeah, there's no other part that I did anything out loud except for that. That has been thankfully deleted. So... <laughs> The snake comes out of her neck, and I don't... Do we know how this magic works, or are we just assuming evil Voldemort dark magic that is very complex? I mean, if I had to hazard a guess, mm-hmm. I would say that there is some sort of, like, magical snake habitat that's been, like, just filling her torso. Kind of like the case that Newt Scamander has, or the thing that they hid Mad-Eye Moody in, where it's something small enough, like the trunk or whatever, where it's bigger than it actually is, or this never-ending bag. And then, you know, like, the arms and legs are just... Just like uh, they're like the robots in Pacific Rim. <laughs> it is funny. The day that we are recording this is the day that the final trailer for Fantastic Beasts 2 Electric Boogaloo came out. And in this trailer, it's revealed that Nagini is a maledictus, I think is the term, where it's not necessarily an animagus, but it's someone who who was cursed, much like a werewolf thing where you don't really have control over it or whatever. And I think eventually it gets to a point where Nagini has fully become a snake, but basically- Like an animorph. Uh, well, they, uh, do they not get to control it? No, well, so like one of the things, so I haven't seen the trailer, so I'm just going to talk about something that I know slightly more about. Go for it. In animorphs, that's one of the things that they can't stay in the animal form for too long or they'll be stuck. Oh. Like one of the main characters gets stuck as a hawk for most of the series. That's pretty dope. He's like in a position where he can't change back for too oh, long. and then man. he's just stuck so that's what i'm imagining okay well in the trailer you basically have this korean lady turn into a snake and then it's revealed oh that's nagini and that's been causing some hubbub but i don't know if this factors in at all but jk rowling says that she's been planning this for 20 years I will just, I will save this argument because I feel like she does lots of retcon, especially in the diversity thing. We're like, oh yeah, Nagini was an Asian woman the whole time. Come on. Wasn't it obvious? Come on. Uh, I clearly need to catch up. (laughs) So Nagini bites Harry on the forearm, which sends his wand flying. There's a big struggle and he gets bound up by Nagini. The Horcrux is freaking the hell out. And Harry then passes out for a little bit. He wakes up, and then Hermione is there, too. Harry is basically dragging Hermione around the room to try to keep her safe, which seems hard to do since they're roughly the same size. (laughs) But they're trying to avoid all these blows from Nagini. But then Harry feels that Voldemort is close, so he tries to get him and Hermione behind some sort of shelter because Nagini's bad, but Voldemort is worse. Then it becomes a weird, confusing thing where he sees the fight through Voldemort's perspective and he can like see himself and it's this weird confusing thing where it's like Harry is Voldemort and Voldemort is Harry and his pain is my pain and my pain is his pain and I was not exactly sure I know reading comprehension was my worst subject on the SATs but I was still kind of confused about who exactly was what but then it turns into a flashback to the time when Voldemort tried to kill Harry The entire thing is in italics, and it's written as if Voldemort had his own book about him, where there was a third-person narrator talking about Voldemort the whole time. Tom Riddle and the boy who just wouldn't die. (laughs) Uh, I do want to point out, because I I think we skipped that, before Voldemort's flashback, they have jumped out a window. Oh, I didn't realize they jumped out of the window. I knew there was glass flying everywhere. Okay, so this is... uh, Glass cut his cheek, pulling Hermione with him. He leapt from the bed to broken dressing table and then straight out of the smashed window into nothingness. Oh. Her scream reverberating through the night as they twisted in midair. And then from Voldemort's perspective, he can see them disappear. Oh, I totally missed that. <laughs> Let me see this. I didn't uh, I didn't realize they disapparated. I'm on 342. Okay, let me see. Oh, yeah, that doesn't actually make that clear, does it? No, not at all. Dang, yeah. Because, yeah, so it says, And then his scar burst open, and he was Voldemort, and he was running across the fetid bedroom, his long white hands clutching at the windowsill as he glimpsed the bald man and the little woman, so Harry and Hermione in the Polyjuice disguises, twist and vanish. Is that, oh, is that? Yeah, so oh. they're, they're disapparating in midair. Right, okay. Twist and vanish. I did not, okay. Ah, ah, I guess that makes more sense. I just thought that it meant like out of sight because they were trying to get away from him. I guess the into nothingness. I didn't realize that twisting meant disapparating. I feel like this might be the hardest 
to parse chapter in all of the Harry Potter books. Yes, especially because they never actually explain this whole italics thing where it goes from Voldemort's perspective because previously, italics, the only thing we know it means is parcel tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about it like now that we've talked about this because so in this chapter, you have a regular like Harry Potter third person narration, mm -hmm. conversation, whatever. You have a fight mm -hmm. in which Harry is semi-conscious and not aware of everything that's happening. Yeah. You have Harry seeing through Voldemort's eyes, described in third person omniscient as Voldemort without indicating the change. And not only is Harry seeing through Voldemort's eyes, but he's seeing himself and what he just saw through his own eyes now through Voldemort's eyes. And you never actually get a part where it says that Harry saw Voldemort. So this is the uh, Christopher Nolan chapter. <laughs> Go deeper. Of <laughs> Deathly Hallows. Coming soon to theaters, Bathilda's Secret in 5D. <laughs> Okay, so yep. now things make more sense. So after they disapparate, we get this flashback, and it's from Voldemort's perspective, but still as a third-person narrator-type situation. So it's Halloween, and there are two kids dressed as pumpkins, and one of the kids turns to Voldemort and says, Nice costume, mister. And Voldemort considers murdering this child. For a couple beats, he thinks, Maybe I should just kill this kid. <laughs> and then realizes, No, that's highly unnecessary. I mean, you really got to appreciate Voldemort's <laughs> restraint, like having read this passage, <laughs> where, like, that's how close he is on a good day mm -hmm. to murdering just anybody mm -hmm. okay so granted it's a muggle yes uh, so like he's already you know more likely to want to murder them like, because he's a big old racist yeah like he's feeling good he's got another thing to do mm -hmm. you know he's on a schedule <laughs> and he still like has to sort of think about like maybe i shouldn't kill this kid <laughs> right like you think like all of the people he doesn't kill over the course of like any scene you see him in <laughs> are now much more impressive <laughs> this guy is exercising some intense self-restraint at all times <laughs> so he does decide to not murder this innocent child who gave him a compliment by the way right he said nice costume it's not like he called Voldemort ugly. Voldemort is trying to look creepy as hell, Mr. Snake Man. So if anything, Voldemort should be like, ah, oh, this kid thinks I look creepy. Well, at this point, since he hasn't died and come back yet, I think he might still look essentially human. Well, they had the Tom Riddle flashback situation where he started to look more and more snake-like, and this is way after that. So I think he still looks pretty. He's got to look pretty. Oh sneaky. no! I'm like I'm sure he's still pretty creepy, but he's no. not like full on full noseless. slit for eyes situation. Yeah, but he's got to be a funky looking dude. Yeah, but he's still got a nose, which is what really he's counts. like the fourth phase on animorphs, not all the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're halfway through the book and the little like flip book portion in the in the bottom, like it's starting to look like a snake, but it's not there yet. <laughs> so Voldemort then approaches the house, knowing that the Fidelius charm is down but the Potters don't know it. He can see through the window James and Lily being very cute and adorable with baby Harry. James is making these puffs of smoke come and Harry is very entertained. It makes me kind of sad that James is just doing sick vape tricks and Harry's <laughs> like, wow, well, cool. But we also learned James is kind of a piece of shit. So, eh, you know, maybe it pans out. I mean, here's the thing that this scene makes me think of. Harry doesn't even know how to make puffs of smoke. Oh, uh, what a noob. Right? Like, <laughs> I mean, we talked last time about the number of things Harry doesn't know how uh -huh. to do. Mm -hmm. That being a wizard, he could have figured out by now. Mm -hmm. He couldn't even do that. Like, what's the spell for puff of smoke? Harry doesn't know. Mm -mm. Hermione knows that. Yeah, 420 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Vaporeon. <laughs> oh, that would be water, though. <laughs> And super effective. So Voldemort goes into the house. James then shouts at Lily to take Harry and go. Voldemort realizes, though, that James hadn't grabbed his wand, so he's like, oh, this will be easy. And he laughs and hits him with a vodka dabra. Then Lily begins to barricade herself in, and Voldemort notes that she doesn't have her wand either. This raises a question. Where were they supposed to go when James says, Lily, go? If she doesn't have her wand, and they're on the second floor... Is he is he telling her jump out the window with our baby? I mean, I or is I mean it could just be a frantic like get out of I'm, here. I'm pretty sure it's a frantic get out of it. I don't think James has thought of an elaborate plan which <laughs> Lily fails to comprehend. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's in a panic because neither of them have their wands, mm -hmm. and the worst person in the world who's bent on murdering them both just walked into their house. And I understand why James didn't have his wand because they note that he puts it down. At one point, mm -hmm. why didn't Lily have hers? It feels like as a wizard, your wand should be on you 
all the time. Especially if you've got this fear that Voldemort might be well, trying they, to murder you. But they don't, though. That's the thing, right? It's like, not only is the house protected by a secret keeper, mm -hmm. but it's protected by a secret keeper who no one would expect. Yeah. Right? Like, you would think it'd be Dumbledore or Sirius, mm -hmm. but they totally didn't pick them. So there's like two levels of security on their house right now. Yeah, I, I feel like I would still just try to have my wand on me at all times, though. I don't know. I mean, I never gave James a whole lot of credit for being... <laughs> security minded yeah and i think that's sort of voldemort's point here right is that their trust in the power of friendship is so absolute that they've absolutely let their guard down yeah it also seems weird that they don't have any other protective charms on the house besides the secret keeper is fidelius the secret keeper yeah. charm so they don't have anything else besides that that seems weird like voldemort didn't have to do anything to get in the house he just like walks in i mean nothing else that he thought was important enough to be remembering in this moment okay so there could have been other stuff that he was yeah. like oh, i'm just so powerful la 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 this well, is nothing and, and to me one of the things that we've seen at this point is that that secret keeper charm is very very powerful yeah it is really right strong. that like every single death eater knows what street the headquarter of the order of the phoenix is on and the only thing they can do is stand there and hope that somebody is stupid enough to show them where it is yeah right like they still can't get in so i think we're maybe underselling how good a security measure yeah. The Fidelius charm truly That is. would have been if they'd picked literally any Anyone. other secret keeper. <laughs> oh, man, no. So Voldemort gets upstairs, breaks down the barricade with, quote, a lazy flick of the wand, just not even trying. Lily begs him to not kill Harry. He keeps telling her to stand aside. She says, take me. She'll do anything, etc. And then this Voldemort narrator says he could have forced her away from the crib, but it seemed more prudent to finish them all, which... Woof is a woof statement, but also a very poor choice. <laughs> <laughs> so he kills her and baby Harry hasn't cried this entire time. But then Voldemort gets very close to baby Harry and points the wand straight up at his face. And then baby Harry realizes, oh, this isn't my dad making fun green lights show all around the room. This is someone else. And then he starts to cry. And Voldemort then has a moment where he's like, oh, I hate when babies cry, uh, which I think is just a fun moment of him just being very, I don't know. It's weird to have this person who's so evil have a moment where he's like, oh, gross. Can you just, can you, can you please not? Yeah, I mean, it is something interesting that I think, like, pettiness is almost more disgusting than evil, <laughs> right? That, like, on some level you can be like, okay, like, if you're, like, a sociopath and you just, like, don't understand why human life is valuable and something like that, that's, that's pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. But, like, if, if you're just, like, petty, uh -huh. you're just like, ugh, crying baby. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that's almost worse. <laughs> So then Voldemort tries to kill Harry and boom, the whole out of body dead. He's got to get out of there. We know this whole story. So then it's another weird thing where it transitions back to being from Harry's perspective, where is it Voldemort? Is it Harry? Blah, blah, blah. Voldemort then sees the picture of the thief, Grindelwald, and Harry then wakes up in a tent, Hermione confirming to him that they got away. But Harry's been unconscious for hours. It's almost morning, and he's been shouting and moaning all night, which I just feel bad for Hermione. <laughs> she's got to be dealing with this for hours on end. Oh, my gosh. I mean, she's got muffalato. True. Yeah, very true. <laughs> I mean, you've probably been screaming. I uh, magically tuned it out after about an hour. I've been listening to some great podcasts to kill the time. Oh, man, have you heard Celestina Warpath? <laughs> have you heard Potterless? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we, we, I got some great ideas for when we get back. <laughs> You're going to hate the Quidditch parts, though. <laughs> she tells him that the Horcrux was stuck to his chest and she was unable to remove it, so she had to use a severing charm, which left behind a scar. Harry puts it in her bag, which... They really should have done the whole time. I don't know why they've been wearing it around their necks the whole time. Do you have a reason for this? This is something Eric and I discussed in the last episode, but it seems like why are you actively wearing something that makes all of you depressed and grumpy? I think the reasoning was that they always needed to know where it was. And the bag is just like a huge room full of stuff. Sure. And the locket is tiny and... I they don't, don't want to misplace it well, or lose I, the I bag. I don't remember if the summoning charm works on it. I think it does. 
I think they Accio lock it in the whole scuffle. Or no, they just take it. They just take it off of Umbridge. I don't think they ever Accio. I don't know that they ever successfully do Accio lock it. My guess would be, especially based on where it was hidden, mm -hmm. my guess would be that it's charmed so that Accio doesn't work on it. Yeah. Because that would make getting it out of the bowl super well, easy. Well, Harry does try Accio lock it in the lake and then it disturbs all the Inferi. So, but that might just be because he's trying to do a spell. Yeah. So I like, I think they say something to the effect of, we always need to keep track of this. Like uh -huh. we need to make sure we always know where it is and that we still have it. Sure. Because losing this would be the like worst. Everything <laughs> they've done to get it. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the original logic. Mm -hmm. And by the time they figure out that it, you know, is the ring from Lord of the Rings. And yeah. It makes you evil by carrying it. It's a little too late. Yep, 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 yep. So they put it in the bag. Hermione says, let's take a break from wearing it for a bit. They both feel guilty and stupid for deciding to go to Godric's Hollow. Harry tries to explain the whole snake being inside Bethilda thing. There's a great moment where he actively decides to not describe the coming out of the neck thing. And the narrator notes, she didn't need to know the full details, which I think is a very smart and prudent choice by Harry. I just thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> Although then we could have gotten... Hermione's version of that sound clip. Yeah, that would have been super fun. So Hermione is still confused about how everything worked, as am I, but I don't think it's something that's going to be particularly clear. I think we have to chalk a lot of it up to Voldemort is very evil and very powerful, and he found a way to turn a giant snake into a woman. I mean, maybe she was an inferior, and Nagini was just sort of hanging out. <laughs> just chilling. <laughs> so Harry reveals that Bethilda never said any words when Hermione was around, because Harry now realizes that the whole time she spoke, it was partial tongue. Well, by the whole time, meaning what the four words that she I said think out only loud. are only, you Harry Potter? Well, she said "come" to go into the room one time instead of just to Harry. Oh, five and, words, and wow. then asked, "Are you Potter?" So four total. You yeah, were right. Great. I stand by my original statement. <laughs> so Harry didn't realize it at first, but now you know hindsight, putting two and two together. Harry also realizes that Nagini then sent Voldemort a message after Harry confirmed it was him, and that is why Harry felt the Voldemort quote of hold him, and that's how we ended up where we are. Harry asks Hermione for his wand, and Hermione unfortunately has to reveal to him that it's nearly severed into two. It's only held together by a single strand of a phoenix feather. Harry asks Hermione to try to fix it. She says, I don't think it's going to work. He says, try. She does Reparo. And afterwards, he tries to do some test spells, tries to do Lumos, and it just kind of sparks and then goes out. And then he tries to do Expelliarmus to Hermione, and it makes her wand move, but not necessarily fly. So it's very much reminiscent of Ron's situation. Not, it's, it's not necessarily as bad as Ron's situation where spells are going in the wrong direction, <laughs> but spells are not doing their full effect. It's right. like a half-assed wand at Probably this point. Probably less than half. Yeah, a, 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 an eighth-assed wand <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Wait, say that again? An eighth-assed wand at this point. <laughs> I'm doubling down. So Harry says we can get it fixed eventually. Hermione says she doesn't think it's possible, bringing up the Ron situation. Harry says that he'll just borrow hers then when he needs it, such as now, because he wants to take watch and guard and let her go to sleep. So Hermione then gives him the wand so he can stand guard. She goes to bed, and the narrator then reveals that Harry wanted, quote, nothing more than to get away from her. So I don't know if he's actually mad at her, and he was just showing very great restraint to not blow up in her face, but... No matter what it is, it's a pretty sad and depressing end to the chapter and this episode of Potterless. Yeah, we started with no Ron and now we end up with so, so much worse. <laughs> yes, we've gone full circle, but a deeper, it's like a spiral where you end up worse than where you started. Just like all camping trips. <laughs> yeah, so that's the end of this chapter. How do you feel about these two chapters, David? Uh, well, you know, this is, has really gotten me thinking again about uh, whether wizards go to church. Yeah. Yeah. And if so, what church? Mm -hmm. And also makes me not want to imagine any more than I have to uh, how a snake coming out of an old woman's neck would look. No, I tried to just breeze by that one when I was envisioning it in my brain, and I'm happy for it. You're welcome, listeners. <laughs>
<laughs> so that is going to be the end of this. But before we go, do you want to talk about any Alas Earwax stuff, perhaps? Maybe by the time this episode is out, your Enter Thickness inspired by our last episode, <laughs> that rap song has gone live. Uh, yeah, so uh, last episode, we got our memeable catchphrase, Enter Thickness. Mm -hmm. So my pious thickness brag rap. Where I will be playing the role of Yaxley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe by the time this episode goes out, uh, it'll be finishing off with uh, the wizard equivalent of the John Cena theme. Ooh. So yeah. I'll, uh... <laughs> oh man, if only it could become that big of a meme too. <laughs> the choice is yours. <laughs> <laughs> so you can check that out. But what's, what's your Bandcamp link? Oh, for it's uh, anything? earwaxrock.bandcamp.com for all things Alas Earwax. Yo, what's good? It's editing, Mike. Yes, we did make that song. It was the intro to this week's episode, and you can get it at that link that David just said. Maybe editing, Mike, put in a different song uh, <laughs> in, in the beginning or the end or somewhere yeah, in this whatever. episode, somewhere. But David, thank you so much for joining along. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before they come out of someone's neck <laughs> wizard on <laughs> in case you weren't aware potterless has a merch store with pins posters stickers t-shirts and all the house colors all you gotta do is go to bit.ly slash merch on all of the shirts are very soft all of the pins are very pretty i think you're gonna like them Potterless is created by Mick Schubert, it is hosted by Mick Schubert, it is edited by Mick Schubert, it is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopu, Rebecca Adamick, Frank Chiotto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juanson, Philly, Eugenia Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Rosemarie Dodge, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadanira, Camille Doc, Russell Dunk, Dustin Molin Cooch, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love. Cash Longer, Allie Madsen, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Krauss, Sean Montag, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Jessica Ann, Arnica the Daughter, Tiago Costa, Daisy Curtin, Stutter, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Steve Trelore, Vivian the Owl, Takari Arant, Haley Hastings, Marino Moster, Pinky Pan, Angelina Withred, Ross Marie Heise, Phineas Ebner, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Basholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Finn Stucky, Mosin Siddiqui, Grace Riggle, Sammy Shaw, Raul Pineda, Ingen Odd Stutter, Mari Wynn, Brian Wingate, Heidi Stoll, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Jen and Juice, Noel Bay Soleil, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin. Fernandez, Patricia Colon, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Ensland, Claire Spencer, Teal, Cena Schutzberg, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Ali Cap 29, Hallie Bowen, Veronica Bartova, Kevin Harnoy, Lada B, Noah, Tracy Toya, Lucinda, Carlos Nino, Pam Webb, Nikki Amio, Colleen King, Jennifer Marklu, Friday J. Svedson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latshaw, Summer Raffle, Heather Fleischman, Vera Colotham, Carrie D. Bagason, Andrea Kroc, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Emily Gale, Ryan King, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Perry, Toothless Walnut, Weekend of Dead Cat Ladies, Maya Gray, Addie Rye, Mark Body, Polly Burridge, Kimberly Savage, Srojan Thanme Gupta, Brittany Gutierrez, Nita Atabani, Bobby Patel, Tumnus Moran, Remy Fontaine, Mats Furley, Sarah Shecker, Lauren Cook, Nova VM, Kyle, Zena Rosnowski, Emily Tilly, Colleen Mage, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can go to Facebook.com slash Potterless, Twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast, or Reddit.com slash R slash Potterless. Any and all information about the show is at potterlesspodcast.com and bonus content lives at patreon.com slash potterless. Thank you so much for listening and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on! Wizard on!